Good evening, everyone. I'm Shannon Miller. I'm the director of the Office of Historic Preservation. Uh, we're really excited to have you all here tonight. Um, I know many of you were at the luncheon today, but um, wanted to make sure that those of you who weren't able to make the luncheon had an opportunity to hear about um, the findings and the report and to meet Don. And then we're also really excited to be in this building. The Milan Building is such a great historic treasure. Thank you so much, Diane, for hosting us. And I know we promised, some of you may have come just because we promised that we would get to go to the penthouse. And we did not lie. You can go. There are people that will um, help guide you up there on the elevator. Um, we just had too large of a group for the whole event to be upstairs. So that's a good thing. Um, I will introduce Don in just a moment, but uh, before I do that, I would like to uh, recognize and thank Congressman Lloyd Doggett for being here. Um, we're it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Um, the Congressman was able to join us at the luncheon today and spoke very eloquently, as always, about the importance of preservation and the, um, the missions and our hopeful uh, listing as a national, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a World Heritage Site. So thank you so much for all of your support for preservation issues, both locally and nationally. Thank you. That's right, just down the street. Um, and so I, tonight what we thought we would do is I've asked Don to give you just a, a kind of high level overview of the report. So don't worry, you don't have to stand there for an hour listening to um, a presentation about every, every finding. But we wanted to give you an idea of some of the exciting things that came out during the study about the, the impact of historic preservation in San Antonio on a number of things. Um, the, the study you will, you will see is, is really aligned around the 11 cause areas that were identified through the SA 2020 process. So um, it's a great look at how historic preservation helps to advance those goals that were identified by citizens of San Antonio. Um, Don is an internationally recognized expert on the economics of historic preservation. He is not an economist but uh, he is a real estate professional and certainly brings to bear a great deal of experience and insight into the importance of preservation in our local economy and, and beyond. I mean, Don talks about numbers, but he's also the first person to point out that there's more to the story than just the economic impact. Obviously, um, historic preservation is, is critical culturally and environmentally sustainable, and there are lots and lots of reasons why preservation is is good and smart for our city. Um, so with that, Don, please come on up. Thanks, Shannon. I, I don't, I'm not, a, I'm kind of an apolitical guy, but I have to tell you, uh, here, yeah, I, I'm in Levin, Washington, so I'm kind of on the periphery of politics. It is, I mean, congressmen get invited to 10,000 things, and usually what they do is come in, wave, say thanks a lot for having me, and then go out the door as quickly as possible. Here, congressmen stayed the entire lunch, including the kind of boring remarks, and, and afterwards, so thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He can be forgiven because he's heard it all before, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, here's how I want to want to preface this. I've known Shannon for a long time, and we talked about this study. Uh, and I have done, you know, over the years, a number of economic impact of preservation studies, nearly always at the, at the state level. Well, Shannon says, okay, I want, I want to do a study in San Antonio, but I want a couple things different. Number one, I want it to be done on a municipal level instead of a state level, because there really haven't been many of those. And second, I want you to find, measure the stuff that you always measure about jobs and incremental difference of heritage tourism and blah, blah, but I don't want to stop there. I want you to think harder about the, the, the additional ways that, in fact, historic preservation affects the life, economic and other, uh, in a city. And so that's how we kind of evolved to taking this, this great uh, SA 2020 document that you know all of you and you know, 6,000 of your closest friends participated in over years to get to pick out these 11 cause areas, each of which uh, starts out with a vision statement. You know, in education, in the environment, whatever. Here's our vision statement of what, what we want San Antonio to become. And so our basic question in this study was, 
how does historic preservation advance that vision? And we found two or three or six metrics in each of those areas that in fact, you don't have to be a preservationist, here's how preservation helps transportation or helps growth management or helps vibrant economy, uh, those kind of things. So we looked at them and, and one of the, the non-numerical conclusions of the study is what is, is in relation to this SA 2020, historic neighborhoods play one of two roles. Either they are already reaching those goals. They're already today in those historic neighborhoods doing what SA 2020 says the city ought to do. Or second, they serve as a model on how uh, the city, ought, other neighborhoods, the city as a whole ought to approach things. And so there's even in just kind of understanding where the city wants to go, there's a lot to learn from the historic neighborhoods. Now, in fact, historic, there's not very many people only about 2.5% of the population of San Antonio live in the historic districts. Uh, and again, how most of our measurements were, what, is the, what do the historic districts look like? Demographically, economically, value, whatever, how do the historic districts look? And how does that compare or contrast with how the city as a whole looked? And so many of our measurements are, here's what's true about the historic district, and here's what it looks like for uh, San Antonio. Let me give you a couple examples that are on the non-economic side. Uh, quality of life, big variable. And of course, on the top of almost anybody's quality of life criteria are, I want it safe and I want good schools. And so that's kind of the, the top of the list. But once you get past those two, more and more are emerging these urban quality characteristics. Things like walkability, things like mixed use, things about reduced commuting time, things like, like uh, proximity to the bus stop, all of which are becoming more and more important in quality of life criteria. Well, what we learned is almost every historic district in San Antonio outperforms the city as a whole. On walk scores, you all know this thing called walk score, type in any address in America on the computer, on the you know, internet, and you get a walk score from one to 100. Every historic district but one has a better walk score than does the city as a whole. Then the people who invented walk score invented the bike score. Every historic district got, came out better on the bike score than did the city as a whole. Then they came up, well, we ought to have a, a transit score. And that includes things like uh, what's, how close is the public transportation, how often do they come, what's the means of transportation. Every historic district outperformed the city as a whole. Now, I've been, you know, for years been looking at value, because as Shannon said, my background is really in real estate economics, so for years I've been looking at the patterns of value change and the incremental value in historic neighborhoods versus other places. Well, I'm so kind of unsophisticated for a long time, I just assigned all of that well. People like this historic stuff and so they're paying extra. Well, that's certainly part of it, but it's not all of it that there's a whole bunch of these characteristics of kind of good cities, good urban life, that are true in those historic neighborhoods that are less true other places, and people are paying for it. And so, let me tell you how they're paying for that. We looked at, literally, it must have been million times 15, 15 million data points for property values in San Antonio between uh, 1998 and uh, 2013. So every, we looked at the property values of every residential property in every one of those years for that year, old period. And we then converted that back down to uh, dollars per square foot, which is kind of the way you measure it, and see what the value change was in categories of properties. Now think about that time period. You had the end of the 90s and the first half of the 2000s where, you know, real estate prices were going up on a kind of opium-driven level, just lunatic appreciation, and then there was the real estate crash, and then depending where in the country it's kind of stabilized and starting to climb back in some places. Here's what we learned over that period, and we, we made three distinctions. We said properties in historic districts, properties in uh, neighborhood conservation districts, which aren't historic districts, as so we didn't count the overall the data from them, and the rest of the city. What did we find is that in the growth years that the 
the neighborhood conservation districts moved pretty much in parallel with the city, a little better, that historic districts outperformed them both. And then when the decline came with the real estate crash, the historic districts started declining later than the rest of the districts. And they started recovering when the other two categories were just leveling out. So in the up years, in the, in the down years, and the stabilizing years, the historic districts outperformed them all. Now, you say, okay, that's good, but you know, those historic districts, that's all a bunch of rich people, so you know, who cares if a guy whose house is worth a million is now worth two million? Well, first of all, not true at all. That we looked at the average value per square foot of houses in all of the residential, all the historic districts that have a residential component. Looked at the average value per square foot in those houses and then looked at the average for the city. Literally half of the historic districts fall below the city's average and half above in terms of their value per square foot. So these were both relatively prosperous neighborhoods and relatively less prosperous neighborhoods, all of which went better on the up curve, less on the down curve. Now a real significant consequence that now people at HUD and FHA and the Mortgage Bankers Association and bankers and savings and loan, people need to be paying some damn attention here because what we found in San Antonio is consistent with what we found now in five other places, and that is the foreclosure rate in historic districts decidedly less than in the rest of the city. Rich ones and poor ones, doesn't matter. Lower, significantly lower foreclosure rates. Now, that's not because, I don't think, people in historic districts never get fired or never run their credit card bill up too much or never get divorced. I think what's happening is that when the market's bad, going down, is there's the, the economics geek term would be downside volatility, but there's less decline in property values. So if I get in financial trouble, I can get that property sold before it goes to the foreclosure process. So we looked at it here in San Antonio, but it's absolutely consistent with what we found in Connecticut, in Raleigh, North Carolina, in Utah, for God's sake, very different places, with the same answer, lower foreclosure rates. Uh, and then the other thing, and maybe one of the one of the coolest findings of all of this. And again, I'm just going to kind of hit some highlights and I'm more than happy to take uh, whatever questions, comments, or go back to Washington, you communist, things, whatever you want to say. Uh, but one of the most interesting things is here you have a, a city that's very proud of its diverse cultural heritage. Not just its cultural heritage, but its diverse cultural heritage and in San Antonio, and I've been, you know, I don't mean I'm expert like you are of the city, but I've been here lots of times in the last 30 years. The real appreciation in this city of the integration of those cultural traditions, the mixing of the, the, this is not just a place with, with, with uh, cultural diversity, but that diversity is shared uh, broadly. So we looked at these uh, 13 or so uh, historic districts that has significant uh, residential population. In fact, as a whole, they are virtually the mirror of the demographics, socio-demographics of the city as a whole. Here's a city that is 63% Hispanic. Historic districts are just is, are a little over 60% Hispanic, virtually the same number. The same share of, of, uh, the, of uh, household composition of families with children, couples with no children, whatever, virtually a mirror. The only place where there was a bit of a skew, where the, the historic districts were a bit better proportionally than the city as a whole, were in neighborhoods, were in uh, households with income under 25,000 and those over 150,000. There were more of those categories in historic districts. So more of the poorest, more of the richest in the historic districts. And that's hardly a thing to quarrel about. But the rest of it was just a mirror and, and the racial distribution, everything. There's these little, no statistical reason that should be true. That for 2.5% for of the population should reflect the, the proportions of the whole, but that's exactly what is happening uh, in these neighborhoods. And by the way, uh, this is a, a Hispanic uh, majority uh, city. Uh, the 13, 11 out of the 13 historic districts have Hispanic majority. Same kind of uh, uh, allocation. Now, I think, hopefully it's not from all of you, but I think that there's probably some people in San Antonio that look at King William, say, yeah, yeah, that's a great historic district, but that's all where those kind of rich people, they all live there. Well, there's, there's plenty of people in Kent. By the way, if you didn't know, King William's one of the great historic neighborhoods in America. And yeah, there's some rich people who live there. But you know what? 
the share of population in King William with household income of 25,000 and below is virtually identical to the share of the population of that income bracket in the city as a whole. There are more people living in, in uh, almost twice as many people living in King William with household incomes under 50 than there are over 150. So this is not, there's the Anglo-rich enclave at all that I, I expect at least there are some in, uh, in San Antonio that, that think and, and elsewhere. The other thing, and then I'll shut up and take some questions. Yeah, I've been paid so I don't have to say these nice things in order to get my you know, final check on this contract. Uh, one of the areas of, of, of the SA 2020, one of the cause areas was civic engagement. And we kind of struggle, how are we going to figure out the role of that civic engagement? Well, what we ended up doing is looking at the civic engagement events, outreach activities that in fact uh, the uh, San Antonio Office of Historic uh, Preservation does. And they do a gazillion of them. They do stuff in archaeology week and preservation week. They do things with people who can afford to get dressed nice and go to the preservation prom. They do a run for kids, a run for adults. They do so damn many things. I'm telling you, I do not, and I, I visit 100 cities a year, and I've been doing that for 30 years, and uh, I have some contact with preservationists in all of them. I don't think there's another city in America that does more aggressive outreach into the communities on all kinds of levels than does the Office of Historic Preservation here in San Antonio. It's extraordinary. It is, it is, it is, it is pretty cool. So with that, I'll just uh, shut up and be happy to take uh, whatever questions or comments. Yeah. No, so yeah, that, that's a, actually a great question, and because we had we had about thirty or thirty-five different numerical measures, and they came from a lots of sources. Some of them came from the census data. Some of them came from the, the city's uh, uh, property tax records. And by the way, the city of San Antonio and the county were very helpful in providing all kinds of data. Uh, some data we got from we purchased. Uh, uh, heritage uh, uh, tourism data. We purchased foreclosure data. Uh, we used for job measurements of uh, an econometric model called Implan. We also purchased and applies to various activities. So out of the out of the 30 or 35 metrics, we probably had 15 or 18 different sources of those numbers, kind of depending what there was to look for. Walk score, we got from the walk score people, which we applied, by the way, to every block in every historic district. So wide variety of sources. Yeah? That being the case, it seems to be the final report in order to reflect where the data came from in the charts. Yeah, okay, that, and I think that's, the, 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 the point was then that the, the charts ought to reflect where the data came from. We made, uh, and that's, that's a, a fair critique, I think. We made a conscious decision not to. And it wasn't at all to avoid transparency or to, you know, kind of pretend. And the reason was, very frankly, is that we wanted it to, to feel like and to be open as a, as a kind of readable, reader-friendly document as opposed to somebody's master's thesis. Yeah, my point being that I look at my neighborhood and it says that 50% of my historic neighborhoods have income family needs of 25,000, and that doesn't mean true. Oh. In today's day, because there's Uh, that's a fair. That's a fair comment. Thank you. Yeah. Two questions. The first kind of simple, yes or no. You talked about the downturn in volatility and how the historic districts are less affected by volatility than others. Did that lead to an increase in turnover because those people could have the ability to sell their house? Uh, I, 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 I can't. Good question. I don't know if if the if the uh, amount of turnover changed that much. What did change was the, so the only thing we measured really in that regard was the sizable uh, 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 lower degree of foreclosure. 
Uh, we, we, we looked at some data that frankly was pretty inconclusive about numbers of sales per year since the recovery, and there didn't seem to be huge differences, at least not enough to try to make a case for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the the question about so you have you have people of relatively modest resources living in a neighborhood where the prices might go up and property tax going up, and is there any recommendations about some form of assistance to 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 you know, focused on them. Uh, and again, this is kind of a philosophical thing, is I'm convinced that reports that are analytical should not also be reports that are recommending. And the reason for that kind of position, and I know that there are plenty of, of, of honest, credible people out there who view it differently, but, but when you're starting out with the goal for the recommendations, there's at least the risk of kind of skewing the data to come up with the recommendations you want to give. So we specifically said, we're going to write the analytic report, not recommendations, hoping that, in fact, somebody will take the next step and say, ah, based on this, we ought to be doing X. Now, having said that, uh, so, so yeah, is it, have we made recommendations in that regard? No. Now I'm an in, independent reader looking at this and said, then what we need to do as a city, that historic neighborhoods are not just about the old buildings. Historic neighborhoods are the character and the quality of the human beings who live in those buildings. And so it is an issue that we need to address. But the trouble is, we, we can't afford to address it after it's all done. So we need to figure out early on how we intervene, how we help people who want to stay in the neighborhood, stay in the neighborhood. And, so, and at a point where we can do it cost effectively. So in fact, we've just been kind of brainstorming today about ways, are there ways to have kind of early indicators of where this might be, a place that might become a historic district, or a place that might might see if, and, and so we can intervene early uh, and kind of make the difference. And my, my, this is a very difficult issue, and, and neighborhoods inherently change. There's no such thing as neighborhood states. They're going one direction or another. Uh, but the issue is not the change takes place, but the speed of that change. That that's what becomes so psychologically and politically and and sociologically disruptive. So we need to figure out how to mitigate the pace of the change, but we need to identify kind of early indicators early on uh, to make that happen. Yeah. Uh, as a follow-up, um, I live in a um, conservation district, uh -huh. and I hear so much that one of the stumbling blocks, I always think of a conservation district as kind of like historic and training. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That does happen a lot. One of the biggest pushbacks, though, is again, my neighborhood, for example, eight years ago, the income was fifteen thousand dollars. Well, now it's like forty. Those fifteen thousand people, well, people aren't making more money. Just people who live in the neighborhood, they're more affluent, and they're totally skewing that demographic because there's not that many of them compared to the people that have lived there for like four generations. Yeah. So I think that something, if that were addressed um, with our local office, I think it would be so much easier to turn um, the conservation district into a historic yeah, I, and I, I concur with that, and, and, and to your point as well, I think that the th most effective uh, public policy strategy for historic preservation is to have a good toolbox of both carrots and sticks, of both, and, and I, don't, I don't think you work if you only have rules that you can or can't do that. I just don't think it works. And I think what happens if you only have incentives is that the most die-hard Tea Party, property rights, independent person, get rid of government entirely guy becomes like the welfare mother thinking that every incentive is an entitlement. So I think that there needs to be a balance of those things and you need to look at the neighborhoods and what kind of tools is needed for what, what neighborhood. Any others? Well, I'll hang around a lot a while, so thank you very much for coming and, and good luck. Congratulations.